Hello, welcome to my channel, welcome to Recent Reads and as usual in this video I'll be talking about the most recent books I finished um, and I have three books as usual so I'm going to start with the first one and that will be a non-fiction written by Mary Roach, it's called Spook. Um, Science tackles the afterlife, okay that's the title. Anyway, Spook Science tackles the afterlife. Uh, I think it's also published under a different title somewhere else. It's called Six Feet Over with the same subtitle. Um, but yeah, uh, that was the nonfiction book that I read. So Spook is a book written by journalist Mary Roach. Uh, and in it, she talks about how she embarks on this journey to sort of um, learn more about various aspects, uh, various supernatural aspects that are related to afterlife and um, she meets up with people who research those aspects such as reincarnation, ghosts, um, spirit communication, near-death experience. She meets with those people at their respective institutions at various parts of the world and so basically she learns more about it and the purpose of her doing this according to her in this book is that she has some kind of um, skepticism. Uh, she's skeptical about this whole thing and she wants to know if she could find more proof of the existence of these elements that would sort of allow her to make a decision you know, for herself whether she wants to believe in those things or not. Now, uh, as a reader who is reading this book at this day and age, now this book was published at this day and age, but you know, I'm just talking about as a reader who happens to be living at this time, I'm pretty sure, you know, we all can agree how the conclusion of this book is going to go uh, with regards to whether, you know, these things are real or not. That is kind of like one of the um, questions that uh, the author is sort of trying to find out with, uh, you know, with, with, with her investigation. Uh, so I wouldn't say that that is like the main question in this book. I'm personally quite interested in this topic. I mean, I'm quite interested in the supernatural as a topic in general because I just find that that topic has a lot of potential for um, revealing more information about people, about culture. Uh, I'm specifically interested about the history uh, and the anthropology and the sociology associated and also psychology associated with supernatural phenomenon because it tells a lot about um, who we are, you know, and how our culture thinks. I just find that really fascinating and at the same time I was interested in reading stuff by Mary Roach because I've heard about her on booktube and so uh, I decided to pick this book up as you know uh, the first book of hers that I want to try. Uh, I would say overall this book provides uh, quite a fair amount of new information for me to learn about, you know, especially regarding the, the topics that I mentioned before, you know, stuff like reincarnation and spirit communication, the history on the studies that have been conducted by certain people in, you know, in these areas, and you know, the studies conducted on uh, the existence of souls, for example, uh, and you know, the existence of near-death experience. I, I find it nice you know, to, to be able to learn those things. However, I would say I didn't really like this book because I didn't really like the um, presentation in it. I, I, I didn't like the delivery and the tone of this book. It has this kind of smug tone to it. Uh, the author has a tendency to make jokes, which I think is, uh, you know, is an okay thing, because it can make you know the writing feel more lively, right? Um, less dry. But in this case, I think it's too much jokes, and uh, and also a lot of the jokes are made at the expense of the people that she interviews, the people working on these 
uh, topics and also at the expense of the subject itself, you know, the subjects themselves. Um, and personally, I don't really like that because I feel like uh, the way the way that she constructs the jokes it sort of um, frames the people uh, working on those topics. It frames those topics as something that is kind of you know kooky and eccentric. And I feel like me as a reader is sort of being manipulated in a very subtle way that you know to think that these people are not credible and I am not really comfortable with that I think it's probably because the author's skepticism is really strong like she mentions it uh, time and time again in this book like we know we totally get that she's skeptical but I think one of the side effects of her strong skepticism is that she would make some, you know, starky remarks on these people, like how they behave, you know, the clothes that they wear and stuff like that. That sort of suggests, you know, implies that they are kind of weird, you know, weird people. And I feel like I'm being primed to think that way, and therefore the, the works that they do would sort of, you know, in my eye feel kind of uh, insignificant, right? Now, I would have preferred if the the book has taken like a slightly different approach, maybe be a little bit more critical and thorough uh, on the technical aspects of the people's uh, research methods, for example. That would have been much more fruitful to me because I personally think that while I was reading you know, certain, some details on the way that they do their research, I do find that uh there are some weaknesses that you know you could identify basic weaknesses in the research like you know the fact that they're researching stuff like soul for example there there is no they're trying to research soul in a scientific way but then they they didn't really like define soul by using any previously established scientific facts you know it's just they want to check on what soul is you know just just basically making this like really big leap to assume that there is something called soul right <laughs> and, and you know and that's just one example i feel like the book would have been would have been much better and more entertaining for me if it has, if it has taken this route instead rather than trying to be like really funny and really jokey you know um and you know, focusing more on the entertaining aspect of it. It just the the tone just feels kind of disdainful. Like yeah, you could poke holes on a uh, certain uh, logical flaw, you know, like in their words. That would have been great. But if you focus more on how these people look like, uh, uh, the fact that they more the loan wearing a suit, which I don't know, like. It, it doesn't make me feel comfortable <laughs> and I didn't like that. Anyway, that's all for the first book. Now moving on to the second book, I have a novel by Elena Ferrante. Now this is, uh, I would say the fifth book by Elena Ferrante if you were to count the Neapolitan Quartet as, as four books. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this will be my fifth book uh, by Elena Ferrante or the second, however you want to think it. Uh, the Lying Life of Adults. This book was originally in Italian and translated into English by Anne Goldstein. Now, in case you don't know, Elena Ferrante is uh, an Italian writer. I think presumably an Italian writer. I'm not sure how confirmed that is. Uh, but their identity is uh, a mystery. So it's, uh, it's pseudonymous. Anyway, The Lying Life of Adults takes place in Naples. It is about this uh, young woman, a teenager named Giovanna, um, who lives in Naples with her parents. Um, she's an only child. And so uh, basically her family life is kind of 
nice, you know, her parents are these uh, liberal, open-minded, educated people, and uh, they sort of have this kind of uh, air of snobbishness around them, but very mild. But this is going to be really important for the book, uh, because this book will also uh, touch on questions of class, right? And um, so basically she lives with her parents in Naples, and one day, uh, you know, she thinks that everything is just nice, her parents are like loving and stuff, right? But one day, she overhears her father uh, just offhandedly comments to her mom that Giovanna is starting to look like his sister Vittoria. And Giovanna is like really intrigued because she has never heard of this mysterious aunt named Vittoria. And the way that her father talks about Victoria has this, he has this kind of disdainful um, tone to his voice. And so Giovanna is kind of concerned because uh, what if her father is suggesting that she is starting to turn bad or ugly or whatever, like this mysterious Aunt Victoria, right? And so she starts to kind of develop some uh, insecurity about herself, her body image, her looks. But at the same time, she's also very um, intrigued by the identity of this mysterious aunt. And so one day after, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, after a few attempts at, you know, prodding her parents and arranging a meeting with this aunt, her parent agrees and she's able to meet this aunt. And from there, I mean, sometime even before that, she learned from her parents that the f her father is uh, in a feud, is feuding with this aunt, and that's why this aunt has never been mentioned in the family. But after she encounters this aunt, she learns more about her. She becomes even more fascinated by her, this aunt who is uh, unconventionally uh, feminine kind of a person. Her personality is brash, she's really direct. Um, but at the same time, she, she, you know, she's, her personality is kind of unpredictable as well. Really fascinates Giovanna, and it is this encounter that will eventually sort of change, uh, you know, Giovanna's uh, own perception of herself. But most importantly, it changes her perception of the adults around her, hence the title. You know, she would eventually learn that her parents while well, they're kind of loving, but they're also kind of messy, because they're humans. And she also learns that Victoria is messy, her parents' friends are messy, and while she learns more about this, she's also growing up, she becomes an older teenager, and she starts to have some messiness in her life as well with her own peers. Now, that's pretty much what this book is about. It is kind of like a... A coming of age story where you have this uh, younger person learning more about the realities of being a, an older person and at the same time it's kind of like a domestic fiction that uh, that sort of tells the story of how the older generation their mess can really affect the upbringing uh, of they're young ones, right? The children, and uh, sometimes you know it's it's unintentional on their part, but it can it can happen, like uh, you know things like divorce or just minor, or not necessarily minor, but things like quarrels, family quarrels, right? Uh, those things can certainly affect the lives of their children uh, and the attitude of their children, especially as they are growing up, right? And I think that this book illustrates that really well. Uh, there's this really similar vibe in terms of the book structure with uh, the Neapolitan Quartet, you know, where um, you have this main character whose life originally is kind of like there. I mean, it's not necessarily like always great, but it's like calm at least and then she meets someone who is turbulent and their life is like topsy-turvy <laughs> and then after that you know things come down again and then after that she meets with that person again and all hell breaks loose and you know it has that kind of structure which really reminds me of that quartet 
Uh, the first half of this book is fascinating because it focuses a lot on the adults of, uh, you know, adult characters of the book uh, and how their own drama affects Giovanna, the protagonist. The second half of this book feels a little bit like, it feels a little bit boring because it begins to shift the focus from the adults towards Giovanna and her interaction with her peers. As Giovanna herself is growing up, she's living a life as a as an angsty emo teenager, right? And she has her own drama with her girlfriends and the boys that she is, you know, she's starting to like and stuff like that. You know, they have their own teenage drama and it gets kind of boring because, you know, teenagers. <laughs> I might be too harsh on that, but yeah, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> anyway, um, things get a little bit repetitive, you know, in terms of the writing at that uh, at that portion of the book. So, yeah, it got a little bit boring, and the ending I don't feel, you know, I don't feel particularly satisfied by the ending. Um, I won't say any any further than that, but. Yeah, overall I gave this book 3 stars, I would still recommend it to you guys. I'm still interested in reading more of Elena Ferrante's books because after reading this one and also, you know, the quartet, I feel like she has a really interesting voice. Like, um, her voice is definitely there, it's quite strong. And uh, I'm really interested in reading more of her stuff. Okay, so for the third book I want to talk about... A Lover's Discourse by Xiao Lu Guo. So before I picked this book up, I was actually feeling a little bit low. A lot of the books that was, you know, that was, uh, that were in my currently reading list at that time just felt a little bit boring. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't really feeling much at the time. And so I needed a little bit of pick-me-ups and, uh... I was already watching a lot of Jia Fei videos at the time, but uh, I needed more, so I picked up this, A Lover's Discourse by Xiao Lu Guo, and um, she's like one of my favorite authors because I really love her authorial voice. Her, um, her writing is really interesting to me because I really like how she plays with form, and this book definitely has a bit of that element as well. Um, although I would say, in terms of playing with form, it is less experimental than some of her previous works. This is her latest novel. Um, so, A Lover's Discourse is about this Chinese woman who is nameless. Uh, after her parents' deaths, she leaves China and she travels to Brexit Britain to pursue her PhD. It is in Britain that she meets with a man with whom she falls in love with and she would you know, she would eventually move in with him and they would start their life together. So in terms of what's happening in the book, that's pretty much what is happening. She leaves her hometown in China, she goes to Britain, finds a man and lives with him. And uh, this, book, this book is pretty much talking... Uh, it chronicles her, the feelings that she has starting when she just left China and when she arrives in Britain all the way until uh, she is starting to settle down, you know, all the feelings that she has about her surrounding, the feelings that she has about China, leaving China, uh, the mixed emotions that she has while she just arrives in Britain, you know, that kind of alienation of being uh, in a foreign land without uh, knowing anybody, um, this, this feeling of loneliness and isolation, and especially kind of interesting when, uh, you know, Brexit is mentioned, you know, with her as a foreigner in Britain, it, it really does kind of give that extra layer of emotions as well. And, but also coupled with the fact that she hasn't really grasped what it really feels uh, it, to be, you know, 
um, to be in a new country that she has never been to, you know, uh, reality versus expectation. Um, she has also really grasped what it really means for Britain to, you know, as far as Brexit goes. Um, and also, you know, the PhD that she conducts, she would eventually learn more about the differences between how the West and the East think. Um, and when she meets this guy that she falls in love with, she would learn more about cultural differences between her own culture and her boyfriend's culture and how sometimes they clash but how they can sort of find a way to interact with each other, communicate. So if you have read Xiao Lu Guo's other works, you would probably notice that this whole thing that I just mentioned, they all appear in her other books as well, in her other novels. And uh, I would say, Xiao Lu Guo, she writes similar things. <laughs> she writes similar stories, but somehow every time I read her book, it, you know, the book feels refreshing, right? And so when I read this, it felt refreshing and it was indeed uh, sort of a pick-me-up because I did feel my mood lifted while reading this book. And I sort of learned something new about why I like her work as well because it is sort of mentioned in here in a way that is kind of self-deprecatingly by the protagonist. And when she she talks about how uh, in the way that she thinks it's it's quite different from you know the way that the people in Britain thinks you know the people around her at the time and she sort of chokes it up to her peasant thinking you know peasant thinking and it really reminds me of how I I, I kind of resonate with that I, I feel like I also have that kind of you know, peasant sensibilities and therefore, you know, there are certain ideas that I would be on board with, right, would agree with the, uh, the popular ideas, but there are certain ideas that because of my own upbringing, my own childhood, my own background, it feels kind of different and when I, you know, when I show it to people, when I try to explain it, sometimes people can't get it and it really resonates with, you know, the, what happens in this book and what happens with this name, the Chinese woman, um, I feel like I could connect with that and, and her experience in this book just kind of uh, speaks a lot about my own experience and I think that is kind of why I would say I really like her writing. Every time when I, when I try a new book of hers, I could experience that so, you know, when people talk about the magic of reading, maybe that's, you know, one part of it. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, as you can probably tell by now, she's like one of my most favorite authors. So I highly recommend you try this book. I gave this one four out of five stars. Uh, and it's not five out of five stars because, you know, with my favorite authors, I would have higher expectations on them so usually I would get a little bit more strict <laughs> whatever <laughs> but yeah this four out of five stars is still a you know this book is still very good um anyway those are all the books that I have so far with me and uh, I'll see you again in a different video so until then take care thanks for watching and bye